Thank you everyone for being here uh, and hello again to everyone. My name is Rose Gerber. I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy and Education for the Community Oncology Alliance. As I do with every advocacy chat, I like to give you some high level, often exciting news that's taking place within COA and within CPAN. As you know, one of our key organizational focuses, focus areas is creating awareness on the value of community oncology. And for cancer patients, one of the ways the value of community oncology is defined is based on that very trusting relationship that a cancer patient has with their oncologist and their entire clinical team, specifically as it relates to their cancer treatment. And as we've shared many times before, what our community oncologists are known for is not only treating the majority of cancer patients across the United States, but giving them a personalized treatment plan and something that is very comforting for a cancer patient and that patient's family is knowing that they are relying on the skill set and the knowledge of that community oncologist whose, whose treatment plan is based on current treatment protocol and research, but oftentimes also on decades of medical experience as a practicing oncologist. The last thing any cancer patient wants, and certainly their family members don't want to deal with this either, is knowing that the oncologist has laid out a treatment plan and now there's interference from other individuals, often individuals who've never practiced medicine. And for any of you who follow COA or for those of you who are new to following our advocacy work within the Community Oncology Alliance, one of our hot button issues is interference by pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs as we often just refer to them. Now, what are we gonna do about it? We also try to be a solution-based organization. So I'm very excited to share that for the first time since COVID, we are taking a large group of advocates to Capitol Hill on June 13th, COA Capitol Hill Day. Who's we? Oncologists, and again, COA's oncologists are practicing medical oncologists with firsthand daily experience with cancer patients. We're taking oncology nurses, caregivers, the individuals that run the cancer centers, and most importantly, the patients and the caregivers. So for those of you that are CPAN advocates or any patient or caregiver that was treated in a community oncology setting, and if you've missed our internal announcements, uh, we have some scholarships available for patients and caregivers that were treated in a community setting. And again, because we've educated you over and over on this issue, by community oncology, we meet independent cancer centers that are owned by the physicians. If you're interested in learning more about this time-sensitive opportunity, you can contact my assistant, Tracy Banks, tbanks at coacancer.org to learn more. Now, moving on to today's topic, uh, May is National Clinical Trials Research Month, and I'm very excited to introduce you to Colleen Lewis, the Vice President of Nursing and Research at Florida Cancer Specialists, also known as FCS. FCS is an independent cancer center, but do not make the mistake of thinking they're only a single site location. They're one of the biggest cancer centers in the United States with over 100 locations. And today, Colleen is going to share her expertise on this topic of clinical trials. Clinical trials is a topic that we educate you on often, and you might wonder why, because clinical trials are such an important part of the treatment and the survivorship for cancer patients. So it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Colleen Lewis. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Rose. I really appreciate the invitation to meet with all of you today. This is an incredibly important topic. Prior to my role at Florida Cancer Specialists, I've spent almost 20 years as a nurse practitioner in oncology, specifically in clinical trials. This is something that I'm very passionate about and is so important as we look ahead to the landscape of how we're going to change the way we treat patients. All of the drugs to date have come through the clinical trial process and are an incredibly important to really changing the dynamic and the landscape. Next slide, please. And we'll go ahead and dive right into our discussion today. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this, at a very brief high-level overview, is what I'm calling our classic drug development process. I think many of you have probably seen graphics of this information out there where the historical models of a drug entering preclinical testing, going through all the different phases of trial, and then eventually, if it makes it through to FDA approval, can take years and years. And there is a recognition that as we evolve as a field, so do the designs of our trials and our processes. Next slide, please. Current state, we do still have four phases of clinical trials. 
and we'll briefly touch on each of them. One thing that you'll start to see on the horizon is new models called adaptive trial design. It's really trying to take into consideration, excuse me, how do we ensure scientific rigor that we're doing all the things we need to to ensure safety, but as we start to get information that drugs are really making a major impact in the lives of patients, how do we get them to patients more quickly and more effectively? And we'll go ahead and start with phase one, next slide. Historically, this has been thought of as that first step bench to bedside. How do you bring a new drug or compound from scientific testing into patient population? While this is still true, and we still do a lot of this work today, we're also hearing about a lot of work where different drugs are being used for new reasons. So perhaps you'll consider it a phase one trial because you're still trying to understand the safety and the dosage in a new patient population, but not all phase one trials anymore are a first in human or a brand new drug. So I think that's something that's really important to educate the community on that some of the prior concerns around phase one trials that it is a drug that's never been tested before is not always the case, especially as we continue to pull in more and more information around uh, patient-specific data that we'll talk about shortly in order to make some really good treatment decisions for patients. Next slide. When we look at phase two trials, this is the next step in the drug development process. We're really starting to look at larger number of patients at this point and really trying to hone in on certain diagnosis or populations that may benefit the most from a certain type of drug. When you then look at phase three trials, you start to increase the pool of patients even further. Next slide, please. At this point, we're really looking to enroll hundreds, potentially thousands of patients, especially if it's an international trial. Typically, these are trials that are conducted across the United States, and in some cases, we collaborate with other countries as well. And one thing that's really important from an education standpoint is when you hear the word randomization, you are really relying on technology to help randomly assign patients to either the control group or your investigational group. And one thing that I really like to point out is this is all done by computer. It's not done by people. I think some individuals have had concern in the past that will there be inherent bias in that process? Will some individual be able to choose and you know, pick and choose who goes into what group and has access to different arms or groups within a trial. And so I really wanted to point that out just in case you hear that concern or myth uh, floated in the community. Really wanted to draw some attention to that. And one really important piece of phase three trials, they are considered kind of the gold standard right now in the way we really get that final information about a new drug. It's really promising in earlier phase trials to see a new drug coming through, but what you really want to understand is, is it any better than what we have already? Are we going to be able to use this new drug or regimen to change the way we treat patients? And that's really helpful information from phase three trials. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted to spend a moment talking about why are some reasons Patients decide not to participate in trials. Fear of side effects. Some individuals are concerned that because it's research, it's risky and that inherently we don't know enough about it. I've heard there's concerns about the individual's loss of control. Will they get a placebo? What if they're randomized and someone has the ability to determine what group they're in and they feel that they might not have that ability to determine their own treatment. Logistical challenges is one of the most common concerns I've heard about in my time practicing and seeing patients. Mm -hmm. Trials are not conveniently located. It requires distant travel and takes too much time. And this right here is where community oncology has an incredible impact on how we advance clinical trial enrollment. 
we have to make these trials much more accessible to patients close to home, close to where they work, because a lot of people are trying to live their lives and have families and jobs and a lot of obligations they're trying to balance. And it's just not practical to expect many people to be able to drive hours and hours for access to clinical trials. And so this is where community oncology really trying to have convenient locations close to home makes a tremendous impact. Cost concerns, of course, is another issue. Insurance coverage and additional costs to travel. So again, if you as a patient have access to a trial that's close to home, that saves you a lot of gas money and travel money and other associated costs. Next slide, please. Some common myths that I've encountered that are out there about clinical trials. We touched on this one just a moment ago that patients need to be near a big hospital to take part in a cancer clinical trial. I think it's important that we continue to spread the word and educate our communities that many community oncology practices do offer trials. They are available and they're much closer to home. Another common myth I've heard is that clinical trials are only a last resort treatment option. That's only a last ditch effort that you think about if you're out of standard options. And now that is actually completely furthest from the truth because when we look at our treatment guidelines that are nationally recognized and followed, clinical trial is sometimes the very first recommendation for certain right. diagnoses. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important to call out. Another common myth I like to touch on is around placebos. I think it's important to note that in cancer clinical trials, there may be in rare instances, times where we do use placebos, but it is not in place of treatment. There are never times where a patient gets no treatment. And so that's something that's really, really critical to highlight. Participation in trials is not important is another one I've heard in Really, our participation rates to these trials is what helps us lead to new discoveries quicker. And a patient concern about staying informed. There's been data published that patients on trials actually get even better level of care because of the additional visits, the required collaboration for the entire medical team. So I think that's something to highlight as well. Next slide, please. Personalized medicine is a very hot topic right now. You've probably heard it in the news. If you're researching trials or other therapies, you'll see it referenced as personalized medicine or precision medicine is another name you'll see a lot. And it really is focusing on how do we take the way we treat patients now, get information through molecular testing, which really looks at mutations in cancer cells and in tumors in each individual person? And how do we respond to that information to make the best informed treatment decisions possible? This is a rapidly evolving field. I wanted to highlight that you'll see a lot of different names used for the same tests, biomarker testing, genomic testing, molecular testing. There's so many different names and in confusion out there, they're actually pulling together teams of scientists to come to an agreement on what is the appropriate terminology for different types of mutations and tests so that we can start to eliminate or decrease some of the confusion out there, especially for our patients. Because if you see all of the different terms, it's really hard to track what we're referring to. Rose, have you seen much information recently out there on personalized medicine? Yes, definitely. And you mentioned that the scientific community is in conversations to, to streamline the naming of these tests. It's also a very, very big focus of many national advocacy groups because patients are so confused, not only, and when we say confused, uh, that sounds negative. Patients are dealing with an overwhelming amount of information when they're diagnosed from the actual treatment decisions, which is the standard chemo radiation surgery. And then when this new terminology is introduced, they don't know what to think. So yes, this is definitely something that's on the patient advocate community's radar as well. So I am happy to see that it, it 
that we're trying to come to a almost singular definition. But you know, I think calling what's important that we could really focus on is that it is personalized medicine. And this gets back to your earlier slide, which I really want to applaud you for drawing, you know, for mentioning that is oftentimes people think that a clinical trial is going to be the last thing offered, like out of sheer desperation. But you very wisely pointed out that this is often presented at the very, one of the very first meetings with the oncologist. And oftentimes that's because there has been testing, you know, of that tumor, the biopsy testing before the patient is in front of that oncologist. So that was a very important comment that you made. Thank you. Absolutely. And one thing I also want to point out, and I'll mention a few times during our discussion today, because it's so important, is the concept of clinical trials and personalized medicine and health equity. Because the more information each individual has about their own disease, the more information their physician has, the better treatment decisions can be made. And so ensuring that our patients have access to this testing is incredibly important. Next slide, please. You can see over the last several years, the number of FDA approved drugs that have been precision or personalized medicine type drugs. You'll also hear the term targeted, meaning a particular drug targets a certain mutation. There is such an uptick in these types of drugs in the field of oncology. You can see in 2021 alone, 35% of the FDA approvals were precision medicine and type drugs. And this further highlights the need for access to this type of testing across the board for our patients. Next slide, please. Clinical trial enrollment has become increasingly more complex as we have more and more data, more trial options. At the surface, those all are positive steps in the right direction. But the more information you have, sometimes the more challenging it is to really decipher and land on the best option for patients. This is where leveraging technology becomes very important and really using the data available both clinically, also on lab reports from this really important molecular testing and matching that up to trial availability across the board. At Florida Cancer, we have this capability we're pointing at FCS Precise, where we use all of these elements of patient data and inputs to really help quickly identify trial options for patients. And there are many practices across the country who are also trying to do this type of work. So I really wanted to highlight that it is getting more complex, the more information we have, and we need to all be united in our efforts to say we need to rely on technology to help us get patients on trials more effectively and also collaborate across the country so that if there's a trial someplace else that we don't offer, then we're all communicating so that the patient ultimately is best served. Next slide, please. I really like this overview of all the different steps and pieces of the puzzle that go into what sounds simple on the surface, ordering a molecular test. As you can see here from this slide, there are so many different pieces and parts that go into it that could also serve as potential barriers for patient access. You can see one key barrier on this slide is patient insurance providing coverage for the test. That's been something that is really on the radar across the board, has been in legislation, both I think at the state level and federally. And it, this is something to really keep on our radar as we want to look to ways to support better access, is really looking to the legislation in your state and see what bills are being proposed and what impact that might have to expand coverage for patients. Pauline, I also wanted to remind our audience that COA has the National Cancer Treatment Alliance and biomarker testing is a very important topic that NCTA is working on, specifically related to what you just mentioned with insurance and with employers as well. That's fantastic. We need that type of advocacy to ensure the appropriate level of awareness for the people who are making these decisions to really understand that these tests are not a nice to have they are becoming foundational to the best care for our patients as we continue to learn more. And really doing our part to advocate for access to that is really important. Next slide, please. 
I will mention this again around health equity and biomarker testing. I also mentioned legislation in Florida, for example, there's current bill that has been proposed that would expand access for Medicaid patients to have mm -hmm. access to biomarker testing. And so be on the lookout for different legislation that's coming because again, some of our patient population, current state does not have easy access to this testing. And that's something we're all very committed to um, ensuring access as we go forward. There are some pretty notable racial and ethnic and socioeconomic disparities in access to testing. Again, just trying to bring awareness so that the more aware we are of the issue, the more we can all work together to try to make change. And these results becoming very important, not just for clinical trial selection, but also to drive treatment decisions throughout a patient's care journey. Now there are many FDA approved drugs that are targeting certain mutations. That if we have that information as clinicians, we can actually choose those really specific targeted therapies along the care journey. Next slide, please. And we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide and, and jump right into some FDA guidance on really a call to action to the clinical trial and scientific community. They are now on a go forward, very committed to understanding what is the race and ethnicity diversity plan of clinical trials to really cast a wider net and ensure enrollment across populations because that is really important to understand how does this drug work in a variety of different types of patients, because if it gets to FDA approval, many types of patients will be taking this drug. So we really wanna ensure robust representation. And so now as there are drug sponsors going to the FDA to say, I would like to pursue this trial as a part of their package, they need to show how are they going to really get this type of diversity. Next slide, please. And in order to more meaningfully recruit patients, there's a lot of recommendations that have been put out there and a lot of them center around the community. Getting more information out to people, giving them education at church events or other social events, really meeting people where they're at to ensure this information is at their fingertips. And then the next wave is making sure they have access to this care in a way that is closer to them, easier to uh, approach. Next slide, please. And if we are able to get patients on trials, how do we ensure that we're able to support them in staying on trial? Because many people do want to do this. And then when they start trials and have to travel long distance routinely, they start to get hit with a lot of barriers and are juggling a lot. And so I think there is a lot that can be done through technology, but also designing clinical trials with a much more patient-centered focus. What are the number of visits we need to get the scientific information, but minimize what's not necessary? I also wanted just to share some insight also, and this is kind of related to your earlier slide on the myths of clinical trials. Well, I we definitely want to have retention of clinical trials because that's how the knowledge base grows and how the science has changed. But I think something that's very comforting for patients to be reminded of is that once they sign up for a clinical trial, they can exit that trial at any time. Is that not correct? Absolutely. That's an excellent point. Participation at any point is voluntary. If for right. any reason a patient decides they no longer wish to participate, mm -hmm. they absolutely can do that at any point. That's a great, great discussion item to highlight. Thank you, Rose. Next slide, please. I really wanted to just kind of focus on, again, the concept and role of community-based oncology in improving access to trials. I really like this notion of centered around you because that is what we are trying to achieve in community oncology. And I appreciate all of you participating in this discussion because the more informed we are as a community, the better we're able to spread the word that there is access out there. And there are efforts being made across organizations to really ensure that we're offering the latest and greatest opportunities and trying to change the way we treat patients. Next slide, please. 
And in summary, I wanted to highlight a few of the things we touched on as a global approach to improving clinical trial access. It really and truly is a critical component to advancing health equity. We really need to look at how do we increase access in our community oncology sites, really focusing on rural and underserved areas, using technology to reach people. Things in the past were only able to be conducted if a patient drove all the way to the research center. I think COVID has shown us that we are able to do a lot via technology, and that's probably been one of the only silver linings of, of COVID is that we've been able to now start to use technology a bit more in the clinical trial space. And I think there's going to be an even further push on that as we look over the coming years. And again, biomarker testing, be on the lookout for legislation in your respective areas and support as you see appropriate. And Rose, any questions from your perspective? Well, I just wanted to uh, make a comment actually, because one of your opening slides was based on technology and I actually wrote down a note because it, it's so important where you mentioned the, let me backtrack a little bit. We talk so much about the personalized care that community oncologists provide, but we're also utilizing technology. And I love the fact that you mentioned how technology plays a very critical role in the investigational versus the control group, and it eliminates bias. And I think, again, that ties into everything that we're talking about now within COA with health equity. So I think that that's just very, something that I think we really need to recognize the positives of technology when related to clinical trials and ensuring that all patients are truly being treated fairly. Um, and I think this has been, you know, like we say with our advocacy chats, they're edu educational conversations, and you have really done a great job educating us today. So thank you, Colleen. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation. And um, I want to thank again our audience for participating. And for those of you who might not have been at the very, very beginning of the presentation, that's okay. We're still glad you're with us. But I did make a really exciting announcement that the COA group, being, meaning oncologists, uh, nurses, patients, caregivers, practice administrators. We're going back to Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C. on June 13th, and we are very excited about having a few remaining travel scholarships for patients and caregivers who were treated in a community oncology setting, and of course, you know, that's an independent cancer center like Florida Cancer Specialists and many others across the United States. So if you're interested, reach out to my assistant, Tracy Banks, T Banks at coacancer.org to learn more, and if you want to watch this chat again, it'll be on Facebook and on COA's YouTube page. Thank you again, Colleen, and thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Oh, and join us next month for our National Survivorship Talk. <laughs> One more slide. Yep, this is a slide. Thank you, everyone.